there are three major ways that transport across the plasma membrane can happen. So we'll go ahead and break them down. We've already mentioned one of the ways actually, vesicles, right? We said vesicles can either bring things to the surface of the cell or they can bring things inside of the cell. Endocytic vesicles um, bring things inside, exocytic vesicles dump things to the outside. So endocytosis and exocytosis, this is our first means of transport. Um, Okay, the main thing that, that this is useful for is if we're moving things in bulk. So it's not just like one molecule needs to get transported, it's a whole, it's a whole set of maybe a hundred molecules that need to get transported. So that's one type of transport. Um, another type of transport across the plasma membrane is this one, passive transport. What this means, this word passive, this just means that there's no energy required in order for this transport to happen. Um, so we don't have to use molecules of ATP in order to power this transport. Let's take a look at some examples of passive transport. Diffusion is our first example. This is a word that comes from, uh, well, it's used a lot in chemistry. If you've had chemistry, then you may already be quite familiar with diffusion. Diffusion has to do with the fact that molecules are wiggling. Okay, they all they have some thermal energy, so they just they're moving a little bit all the time. And if you have some that are wiggling and they're close to each other, they might bump into each other. And when that happens, they might sort of bounce apart from each other. So what ends up happening if you have like a whole bunch of molecules together? they tend to spread out over time due to these random collisions that are taking place. A really good way to see this, let's just jump over to the picture here. What we have is a tube of water and what somebody did was inject some blue dye right here. They've got some dye right there. They didn't disturb the water, they didn't jostle it or anything, they just carefully injected some dye. And then they waited to see what happened. So they came back after an hour and look what's happening. That dye is starting to spread out into the water. We would say that the dye is molecules are diffusing into the water. They're spreading from the area where they're really highly concentrated out into the regions where they're less highly concentrated. Um, come back 24 hours later and it's, the diffusion has just continued. So it's continuing to spread out. So diffusion, this always takes things down the concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration. Um, another familiar example of diffusion would be perfume. Okay, if you just, if you open a bottle of perfume, don't spray it or anything, but just open the bottle of perfume. And if you're, if you stand a few feet away, what's gonna happen after some time you might start to smell it. And that's because the molecules are diffusing from the perfume bottle out into the air in the surroundings. So diffusion takes some time, um, but it's, it's effective as far as it causes things to move. Um, so that's a type of passive transport. We didn't have to provide any energy. It just happens because molecules are wiggling all the time. A special type of diffusion is osmosis. And this is something that's very relevant in biology. Osmosis is specifically the diffusion of water molecules and specifically across uh, some type of a membrane, a membrane that allows some things to cross but not others. So what are we talking about here? This seems kind of vague, a selectively permeable membrane. Um, a great example of this is the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable. It lets some things across but not others. So um, looking down here at this sort of artificial setup, what we have is a selectively permeable membrane right here in yellow. And we've got a basically a sugar solution over here. It's water with glucose in it. And then on this side, we have pure water. And um, this membrane, it doesn't let glucose cross, okay? so. If it did, what would happen to the glucose? The glucose would diffuse, it would spread out and come over to this side, but that can't happen. The glucose isn't able to cross through. So instead, what happens is the water diffuses. The water is able to cross that membrane. So what's going to happen is the water will move down its concentration gradient. So over here, water is really concentrated, right? 
Over here, it's not quite as concentrated because there's some glucose there. So what's gonna happen is water will move to the left across this membrane. Consequently, um, this, this section is going to get taller. This column will start to rise. And eventually, the weight of that column is going to prevent any more diffusion of water to the left. So there kind of ends up being a balance of forces in these two directions. And that's called osmotic pressure. That weight of the column that's preventing more osmosis from occurring. <clears throat> okay, so still talking about passive transport. Let's talk specifically in the context of cell membranes. All right, so there are three types of tra passive transport that we see across cell membranes. The first one over here on the left, this is very a very like straightforward example of diffusion. This happens with molecules that can cross the plasma membrane um, without any special help involved. So molecules that are very small and nonpolar, such as oxygen molecules or carbon dioxide molecules, those are nonpolar. They don't have any polar bonds. So they're able to squeeze past the lipid section, the lipid bilayer. Um, okay, so that would be just simple diffusion. Another type of passive transport is shown right here in the middle. This is one where there's some type of a protein channel that's, facil that's allowing the uh, diffusion to take place. So this is a perfect example of how water can cross a plasma membrane. Water is a little bit too big and too polar to be able to diffuse through the phospholipids. However, there are channels that allow water to diffuse through. This channel just provides a little bit larger opening and water can diffuse down its concentration gradient. Finally, over here on this side, we have facilitated transport. This is getting a little bit more complex. So we have some substance on this side that is more concentrated than on this side. So it wants to diffuse across, uh, but it needs a special pathway in order to do that. The pathway isn't always open though. Okay, so what has to happen is this molecule would bind to its transport protein and that binding would cause the transport protein to undergo a shape change, open up to the other side. So in the end, that molecule gets taken in, uh, shape change happens, and then it gets dumped to the other side of the plasma membrane. That's called facilitated transport. There's still no energy expenditure, um, so this is still a type of passive transport. But there you have it, a few different types of passive transport across the plasma membrane. The third way that things can be transported across the plasma membrane is by active transport. And you might be guessing what this means, okay, passive transport versus active transport. Active transport means that there is some energy required in order for this transport to happen. So active transport, this is very useful if we need to move substances up the concentration gradient. So maybe we want to bring something from where it's not very concentrated to where it's more concentrated, that's a difficult thing to do. That's gonna take some energy. Um, so this is for moving things particularly against their concentration gradient. A great example of this, let's come back to our schematic here. Here's the plasma membrane. Here's a protein that's embedded in it. And let's say we want to um, perhaps get rid of this molecule. This, maybe this is a waste molecule that's in the cell and we wanna get rid of it. So what would happen is there's a special protein that takes up that molecule and then it uses a molecule of ATP in order to power the transport across the plasma membrane out of the cell. Okay, so that would be a type of active transport. We could either do this with a molecule of ATP or we could power it by some other means. We could use a concentration gradient of some other substance. This gets pretty complex, but it's also pretty fascinating. This is how a lot of things um, are transported in cells. We'll, we'll see examples of this later on in the course, but what we have represented here are two different types of molecules, are the purple squares and the black spheres. And let's see here, what's going on? It looks like we've got more black spheres out on this side. Okay, and not very many of them inside. So what's happening 
is the black spheres are moving down their concentration gradient. They are diffusing across the membrane in this direction. And that movement is powering the transport of something else as well. Okay, so um, see how this purple square, it just kind of tags along with the black one and ends up coming inside. Okay, this is actually moving the purple from where it's not very concentrated to where it's more concentrated already. So moving the purple squares against their concentration gradient. That's actually being permitted due to the fact that um, we're using, we're powering it by the diffusion of the black spheres, essentially. Okay, I want to go through one specific example of active transport with you. And the specific example is the sodium potassium pump. This is a pump that is super important for cells in the human body. This pump helps to maintain um, the ionic environment of, of pretty much all of our cells actually. And it's also really important when we come to signaling, um, nerve signaling, how, how, do, how does the nervous system work? It depends heavily on this specific pump. So, um, I started using the word pump and I realized I haven't explained what do we mean by that. Okay, so some of these, some of these proteins, I'll just back up for a second. Some of these proteins that are in the membrane, they are pretty much acting like pumps, right? They're taking something from one side and pumping it across to the other side. So a lot of these proteins are referred to as pumps. That's just kind of standard in biology. So this is an example of a pump. And this pump is special because it moves it moves sodium ions in one direction and it moves potassium ions in the other direction. So it's actually pumping two different things in two different directions. It's really fascinating. Let's go ahead and take a look here. So what happens, here's a plasma membrane with, in purple, that's the pump protein. Um, and what happens is first up, it picks up some sodium ions. So we can see that they are binding there inside of the pump. And then what happens is the pump uses some ATP and that powers it to release these sodium ions to the outside of the cell. Okay, so it just pumped three sodium ions out of the cell. Next up, once it releases those, uh, what happens is there are some binding sites exposed for potassium ions. So potassium ions come in from the external environment, they bind to the pump, and that binding causes a shape change in the protein, causes it to open back up to the inside of the cell. So now potassium gets released internally into the cell. Okay, so whoa, what just happened? We released three sodium ions to the outside of the cell and we brought in two potassium ions to the inside of the cell. So thinking about this in terms of charges, what have we just done? Um, the net result is we moved three positive charges out and two positive charges in. So we just made, uh, we just kind of made a change, right? We just increased the positive, the amount of positive charge outside relative to inside. And this is actually true of cells. Generally, they are more positive on the outside than they are on the inside. We're gonna come back to that later on in the course. Um, for right now, Let's go ahead and think about this in the context of diffusion. So cells also have channels that allow simple diffusion to take place. Um, so a lot of this potassium that gets transported in, it will actually diffuse back out through one of these other channels. Okay, so things kind of come to, a, to an equilibrium, come, come to a balance here. Sodium can diffuse inwards, but not very quickly, it, it takes it quite a bit of time. It's harder for sodium to diffuse back in. Um, so depending on the balance that this cell ends up with, the balance of ions, that can drive water to either move into the cell or out of the cell. Remember water tends to, by osmosis, water tends to follow other things. Okay, so water is able to move across the uh, plasma membrane through a uh, pore. And so if we have a lot of um, ions inside of the cell, what will happen is water will also tend to diffuse inwards by osmosis. And so in that case, this cell would start to swell. Um, on the other hand, 
if we have a lot of ions on the outside of the cell, then what's water going to do? Water is going to tend to leave the cell also and the cell would start to shrivel. So this has some really important implications. Let me just go on to the next slide here. What we're talking about with considering these different um, locations and presence of ions or not is tonicity. Tonicity is a word that refers to comparing two different solutions to each other and their solute concentrations. So um, let's see here. Let me start with let me start with this one on the right. Okay, what we're going to do is think about this cell. This is a red blood cell, and it's sitting in some pure water. Okay, so if it's in pure water then what's gonna happen in terms of osmosis? Which direction would water want to move? Would it want to move into the cell or would it tend to move out of the cell? If you think about the fact that cells have ions inside of them, right? Um, then what's gonna happen is, that you should come to is that water will move inside of the cell. So this is a cell that would start to swell and if it swells too much, it's going to burst. So that would be a real serious problem. This is actually very relevant in the context of um, IVs, IV solutions. You would never give an IV that was pure water. It always needs to be an IV that has a really specific concentration of ions because we don't want this to happen. Okay, so instead, what we would need to do is have an IV with a solution of um, maybe some salt mixed into it in order to get the ion concentration just right so that it matches what's inside of the cell. And that's called an isotonic solution. If it's the same, uh, if the two solutions that you're comparing are the same in terms of the ionic conditions, then um, the net diffusion of water is going to be the same out as it would be in. So things will stay nice and balanced. These cells will be very happy, stay the right size. The other extreme is a hypertonic solution. So this would be like having way too much salt in the surroundings of the cell or an IV solution that's way too salty. What's that going to cause? It's gonna cause the water to move out of the cell towards the salt. And so this cell would shrivel up and would not be able to survive very long that way. So in terms of tonicity, the words for that, uh, for these different conditions, we would say that this is a hypertonic solution compared to what's inside of the cell. Over here, we would say this is a hypotonic solution compared to what's inside of the cell. Hypo means low, it's low in salt or whatever we're talking about. Hyper, this means kind of high in something. So high in salt out here, this solution is high in salt compared to what's inside of the cell.